This morning we will be in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, and we'll focus on verses 19 to 27. Hebrews 10, verse 19. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, Let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. Let's pray. May Jesus Christ be praised. May you be praised, Lord, in the meditations of our heart, in the reflections of our minds, in the living out of our faith, in our trials and in our joys, in our individual experiences, and in our corporate experience as a church. May Jesus Christ be praised, and may your Spirit please help us to do that now. Amen. A while ago at a pastor's fraternal, I mentioned to the brothers there that we were beginning a series on church covenant, and Mario Manavil of Reformed Faith Mission Community Church immediately offered some encouragement by telling me of their own experience in this, and What he shared was very interesting, so I asked him to write it down with a view to sharing with you, and this was some of what he said. The church covenant has been a huge blessing to us as a church because it is a reminder to every member of our commitment to each other individually and as a local church. The church covenant is basically an exposition on what the scriptures teach about how we as members of this local church should relate to each other. This was one of the wisest decisions I think we made from the planting of this church. It has been what members remind each other about when they have grievances with each other. We used to recite the church covenant whenever we have the Lord's Supper, but now we do it once a month and when we receive new members into the church, also during ordination of deacons and elders. I also let the church recite it when my exposition of the text lays strong emphasis on the one anotherings. During our new membership classes, I teach about four sessions through the church covenant in order to have new members understand how serious we are about our membership in this local church and also to show practical application of the covenant. I love the church covenant. I think it is biblical and brings much glory to the Lord, and it helps to create that gospel culture that our church is known for. End quote. Now, I mention this this morning both because it reinforces what we heard last Sunday and because it leads into what we see this morning. To recap, last week we began our series by seeing how a church covenant is a set of solemn resolutions voluntarily made by the congregation to act and behave in accordance with Scripture, uh, God helping us. Our desire as elders at Goodwood is to motivate this to Goodwood Baptist Church for our common good. It differs a bit from a church confession, which focuses on what we believe, and it puts the emphasis rather on how we will live. 
While studying Nehemiah 9, we saw how such man-made covenants have a biblical and historical precedent. The language of the Bible is the language of covenant. We also saw how a people who confess the same Lord and authority and doctrine and promises and salvation and struggles and grace may make a firm commitment in writing and put their names to it, and how enthusiastically they did so on that occasion. A church covenant formalizes what is already required by Scripture and what is already implied by church membership. And let me take a moment to clarify something about last Sunday. Uh, While introducing the idea of the church covenant, I took the opportunity to address those that have a history of refusing to be accountable uh, to a local church. Those who cannot live up to certain biblical obligations because they will not bind themselves to a congregation. To be clear, I was addressing the spirit of past objections in the uncommitted. I was not addressing future concerns in the committed. I was not speaking to faithful members of this local church who who might have reservations, who may have queries down the line. Uh, we, We may as a congregation decide not to adopt a church covenant. And you are welcome to ask questions at any point and even to disagree if you'd like to do so. But covenant or not, whichever way the church goes, we all have a responsibility to fulfill the duties of church members to do exactly the sorts of things that covenants are talking about uh, because they are scriptural obligations laid upon us by Christ, the head of the church. Now this morning we continue to see uh, the sorts of things that would go into a church covenant and their implications. Specifically, we focus on that most visible expression of the church in covenant, that is our gatherings, our meetings together, especially our corporate Sunday worship. Corporate, if you're not familiar with the term in this context, it doesn't bring to mind industry and commerce. It simply means to form into a body, uh, to body together the church body, the people, together for the purposes of worshiping the triune God gathered in His name. And Hebrews 10 is our primary passage now with a particular attention given to verses 24 and 25. As with last week, I will take the opportunity to explore other things relating to gathering together, seeing as we on that subject, things like our attitude and the responses while gathered and how we prepare and so on. But what would actually go into a covenant would be much simpler. It it wouldn't have all the details I'm going to list now. It would just be something like, and I'm quoting from other covenants that churches have put out there, we will not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, nor forsake attending to the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper. It would be that simple. So we will begin with a look at the privileges and responsibilities of the church in Hebrews 10. The privileges and responsibilities of the church. It's a rich passage with an even richer context, so I'm going to have to limit my comments as we go. The writer is speaking to Christians of Jewish ancestry and descent uh, who were tempted to go back to Judaism, to leave Christ and go backwards. And like any preacher, he speaks with a mixture of, of warning and encouragement, strong words and gentle ones to rally them to be faithful to the living God. In this section of the book, we see firstly a privilege for a particular people. Using language that will be very familiar to the Jewish readers, the Spirit of God reminds them of the believer's privilege, of your great privilege if you are a Christian this morning. He says, you don't go to God with trembling through an earthly priest. No, you go with confidence to a heavenly high priest, to Jesus Himself. And you don't go to an earthly temple. No, you enter a heavenly temple in a manner of speaking. You approach God freely in life through prayer and in death by going to glory. And you don't go with the blood of animals soaking your hands just to see a curtain blocking the way between you and God. No, you go in remembrance of the Son of God's blood, once shed, that tore apart the curtain and opened the way. Consequently, you, Christian, may draw near to God with a true heart in full assurance of faith. You may come to Him, hearts changed, 
conscience cleansed, and the memory of the forgiveness of sins as though they were washed away by pure water. Young Christian, new Christian, weak Christian, tempted Christian, fallen Christian, this is your privilege as part of the bride of Christ, as part of the church of God. Then we see, though, that it is a faith that is expressed corporately. Did you notice all the plurals in the text? Children, did you see that? Did you hear that while I was reading? It doesn't say, I, me, my. It says, we, us, ours. It's the language of togetherness. It's the language of becoming one. It's the language of church. Uh, Just picking up on those words as you go through the verses, it sounds like this. We, us, we, us, our, our, us, our, us, one another, you, plural. That's the Christian life according to the Bible. It's not I, me, my. It is church life with we, us, our, one another. And that's not merely at at a broad level, like when we talk about the church across the ages, It's also narrow and practical, meeting together locally as a congregation, which is the entire testimony of the New Testament, and every book is written either to two churches or about churches or to people in churches or concerning church matters. There was no such thing in the New Testament as a sheep off to itself, not unless that sheep was in danger or distress. There was only the the flock of the great shepherd, manifesting and seen locally with communion, baptism, leadership, discipline, instruction, accountability. Such was the New Testament church. Then we see a perseverance that is necessary, verse 23. Every Christian must persevere in their faith and commitments, must make every effort to hold fast their confession in Christ, our hope without wavering. And why do you tell someone to hold fast, to hold tight. You tell them that because there's a danger of them not doing that, because they're tempted to let go, to give up, to do something else. Uh, Children, if you see a friend clinging by their fingernails to a cliff edge, and there's a great drop beneath them that will smash them to pieces if they fall, what do you do? You shout, hold on! I'm coming. Well, you don't do that. You don't want to fall off. You call someone else to help them. But you say, hold on. Hold fast. Don't give up. And that's what the Spirit of Christ is telling Christians here. Hold tight to the gospel, the good news. Hold tight to the words of Jesus Christ. Hold tight to His people to help them and be helped by them. There are things in the world that will pull you away. They will tickle you under the arms to make you laugh and let go, and you forget how serious this is. But you hold on, for He is coming. The Son of God is coming to help in this life and to deliver us to the next. Which brings us to the next item there, which is a dependence on Jesus Christ. Verse 21 and 23, because if you know yourself, as we saw last week, you know your heart is not so trustworthy and your strength so great so as to be able to hold on. So what do you do to keep on keeping on? How do you persevere so as not to fall away? Verse 21, you draw near to God, call on His name, plead His grace, feed on His promises. And you remember verse 23, He is faithful. Jesus Christ is faithful. He will not forsake you. He will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able to bear. He has never once in all the long history of humanity failed to keep His word or do what is right by His people. He can be trusted. You can depend on Him. And you must. And one of the ways He helps you is found in the next point, a gathering of God's design. Let us consider verse 24 how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. The Spirit of Christ declares this as a duty, 
describes it as a need, offers it as a help. The church working and meeting together to encourage growth and perseverance so that we hold on. Verse 24, our relationships with one another should be such that encourage greater Christ-likeness. We should see each other coming and know that here is a brother or sister who loves my soul and whom I love in return. We are our brother's keeper, only the sons of Cain think otherwise. And no, I don't, I don't mean uh, that we are policing one another like the Gestapo, uh, nor being busybodies and we never mind our own business and we're always meddling in one another's lives. No, I mean we have a genuine interest and concern and affection to help one another grow in the faith, uh, not merely to be motivated by our own agendas. Brothers and sisters, you, you should have Christian friendships with others in this room. The sorts of friendships that include spiritual conversation, the sorts of friendships that include prayer. It should not be a strange thing for you to pray aloud with your Christian friend. It, it should be natural. It should be glorious. We need one another. And verse 25, meeting together should be natural. It, it's, it's sad that in the first decades of the church, there were already those who neglected church gatherings, who had a, a habit of absence, who were ready to forsake uh, worship easily. Already back then, and continuing even now. I don't mean you miss a Sunday here and there because you're sick, or you're away on a holiday, or traveling on business, or maybe occasionally visiting another church, or you're doing some sort of essential services work, or very rarely there's some other commitment which comes about extremely infrequently, not as a habit, but as a rare exception. Of course, there are sometimes things outside of the ordinary that arise, and they require care and wisdom and prayer as to whether we entertain such a thing. But what I mean, rather, is those who miss church because they have no appetite for it. Those who miss church because their affections have been captured by the world who care more for the English premiership or spring cleaning or sleeping late or having regular Sunday sports or making it their day of exercise and excursions and sightseeing, the result being that they develop a habit of being away. They neglect fellowship, they neglect the body, they neglect the dearly beloved bride of Jesus Christ. Don't do that, says the Lord in Hebrews 10. Don't do that. It's dangerous. It's not holding on. It's loosening your grip. It's opening yourself up to greater sins. It's robbing the people of God of your presence and service. It's selfish. And it's been observed by elders in many churches that when such habits set in, there is always an underlying spiritual cause. As one person has said, non-attendance is either a portal to sin or a reflection of sin. Absence is just a symptom of something else that is going on, sometimes not being converted at all. But God designed for there to be a day together. And God designed for there, a be, for there to be a people to be gathered to. And in God's design, that day and that people are used by Him to keep us growing and persevering and holding on. It brings us to the next little item, which is a day drawing near, verse 25. Don't miss that last part. Did you see it? Children, did you read it in your Bibles? Hebrews 10, 25. It says, all of this that we've been doing, do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. What, what day is that? Is that Sundays? No. Is it daytime? No. So what day is it? It is the day when Jesus Christ returns to judge the living and the dead. That day, the last day. And how do you get ready for that day? First, 
You repent and believe the gospel of Jesus Christ so as to be saved from death and hell. But Hebrews is talking to people that have already done that, isn't it? It's talking to professing Christians. So how do we who are saved get ready for that day? We've just been told. Verse 22, draw near to God. Verse 23, hold fast to faith. Verse 24, stir up one another to love and good works. Verse 25, do not neglect church meetings. Attend and encourage your brethren and do it more and more and more and more as you wait for that day. The Christian who has a weak, neglectful commitment to the church is not ready for the Lord to return. They, they might be saved, yes, they may or may not be, but they are not ready by this definition because they're not doing what Hebrews requires. And then there is a final warning in this selection of verses concerning a lifestyle that leads to hell. What does the Bible say to the professing Christian who claims to be saved, who claims to be a believer, and yet lives unrepentantly in their sin? No, not, not talking now to the believer who falls, uh, who gives in to temptation and then rises, confessing their sins with tears and seeks the Lord. Not talking to them, but verse 26, the one who goes on sinning deliberately after receiving knowledge of the truth. The one who by their conduct, if not their confession, who by their actions, if not their words, sets aside the Son of God and treats his sacrifice and his lordship as worthless. What does the Bible warn? Verse 27, Fearful expectation of judgment, fury of fire. Verse 29, punishment. Verse 30, vengeance. Those are the blunt force realities of making a confession of faith, but rejecting and neglecting the truth in one's life unrepentantly, deliberately, ongoing. Now, the writer of the Hebrews goes on to encourage them further to speak more gently to them. But I just mentioned this much so as to highlight the role of the gathered church in preventing any one of us from being so self-deceived as to fall into that sin. Of, of helping us to keep on persevering so that we are accountable to one another. So that we can say with verse 29, but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. So there is a, a short exposition of those verses concerning the privileges and responsibilities of the church. My second major point is some practical implications for our meeting together. And this is going to be a lot of application, a whole bunch, in a short space of time, which means there's room for misunderstanding. Please hear me charitably, uh, and let me say up front that everything that follows now is undertaken in fellowship with Christ, in dependence on the Spirit's strength and power as we pray to our Father in heaven, acknowledging our shortcomings. All right. It's... it's Everything that follows now is the overflow of private worship, but it's not a substitute for it, as if we get these things right externally, everything is fine. No, it's an overflow of a living engagement and relationship with the Son of God. Firstly, we prioritize meeting together in a local church. At the most basic elementary level, membership in a church means regular attendance at that church which means Sunday services have a fixed and permanent residency on our calendars. It's not there to be swapped out with other opportunities that might come up and be weighed against the one that's already on the plate. It's not there to be negotiated away with friends or family who want to come for tea that morning. The response then is, no, I have to be in the company of God's people to worship and to serve them. Why don't you join us instead? Come to tea afterwards, but come to church with us first. Now, I've already addressed the obvious exceptions earlier on, but I, but I stress this, prioritize, 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 because we are in a culture that offers so many alternatives, attractive alternatives to take us away. And it falls to the people of God to be different, 
not to be legalistic, but just to be faithful, to ensure that our meeting together has a royal place of primacy in our lives. It is not easily or willingly forsaken. It is entrenched until kingdom come, literally, according to Hebrews 10. And you guard Sundays like a like a mother bear with her cubs or a, a lion with its food. You fight for it when temptations come to draw you away. Many won't be aware of this, but it's a hallmark of Reformed Baptist churches and those that hold the 1689 Confession of Faith that Sundays are indeed different. I'm not getting into deep Sabbath day practice arguments now, which would take us down a hundred different rabbit holes and we'd never find our way back. I'm just emphasizing that our own Christian heritage has, has always held that one day is especially holy and set apart. All seven days are to be holy, yes, absolutely, but one day is marked as different even from the others. It's the day that we meet together, that we gather in His name. And Christians, we need to cherish this opportunity. We need to protect this day from encroachment from the world in the face of our fiercely individualistic and pleasure-seeking culture. We need to find and keep our joy in the bread of heaven and the fellowship of believers. Married couples, would you be willing to go against the will of your spouse if they start to neglect fellowship? Of course, I want. I would say we we would encourage and stir them to attend first, uh, but if they don't, because they are lazy or because they are worldly, would you say, I cannot stay away. I am going, and I will not make plans to do otherwise. And if you make plans to do otherwise, I'm still going to church. Would you do that? Those of you that are love-struck, who have met the perfect person and who can't bear to offend them, would you stand firm in your commitment to Christ and His people? Because many couples, they, they start well and then they fade away because one of them grows more worldly, or perhaps they were always worldly, but Cupid with his little bow got in the way of seeing that. Y- young adults, teenagers, when Sunday services are no longer populated by all your friends as they are now, will you still be here? Once that social draw card is taken away and your friends have moved away and are studying away and have got jobs away, will you still be gathered to the people of God? Is the reason you are here for Christ or for your friends? Older folk, when others rise to fill the roles that you once had in this church, and the temptation is to step back from church life, will you resist that? Will you continue to set an example of steadfast prayer and activity and attendance for those who come after you for as long as your health permits it? And parents, consider this. It might sound shocking, but it's not enough to model Christ to your kids privately in the home. That's important, but Christ has a bride. And that bride is the church, which He purchased with His blood. So you must model church to them as well. Christ died for His bride, so show your children how to die to self and serve others. Show them the death of the Son of God that it was for the flock of His uh, sheep, not just for one of His sheep. Parents, you must model the bride to your children. And while we do not worship in a temple, let our children hear the spirit of the psalmist in us saying, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. The second sub-point here then is we prepare for our meeting together. We prepare. Anything this important deserves preparation. You you prepare for a business meeting. You prepare for a test or an exam. And both of those things rank below the importance of worshiping the living God who is a consuming fire. So let us prepare to meet one another for for the good of others and for our own good as well. Remember uh, the words of Ecclesiastes 5. Again, 
in a temple context, I acknowledge that, but it still offers a sound wisdom about general preparation for worship. It says, guard your steps when you go to the house of the Lord. Pray then for a heart and mind to be focused and receptive as you come to this place. Pray for others as they come asking that the Lord would help you to serve them when you are here. Lord, guide my steps to visitors. Guide me to the lonely. Guide me to the despairing. Open up conversations that I would not otherwise think to have because I'm prone to chatting about lesser things. Mortify that selfish part of my, my flesh that is lazy and wants it easy. Help me to serve others. Pray for lips that are true when you sing and wise and kind when you speak. Pray for the preaching of God's Word. As someone has said, you'll get a better sermon. And parents, fathers especially, prepare, for your, prepare your families. Make sure your families get enough sleep the night before, not binge watching late, so as to be zombified in the morning. Uh, maybe read ahead. Find out what's being preached about. Ask for the songs if you'd like to practice them as a family. And pray after the service as you go, thanking God, asking for the Holy Spirit to cement the truths that are heard so that they are not forgotten. I know families here uh, differ in the details of how they do these sorts of things. Some recite the catechism in the, in the car on the way to church as they pray. As others uh, may have a private morning devotion before they get here. Um, my own family, we, we sing in the car and we pray. Uh, but however you go about it, in some way I encourage you men to prepare your families for this sacred gathering together. Then we, thirdly, we meet together to obey the great commandments. Our, our, our meetings should lend themselves to the first and greatest commandments, to love the Lord God, our, our God, with all our heart and mind and soul and strength, and to love our neighbor as ourselves with first things first. The services, they, they focus on worshiping the Lord. And we, we'll talk more about this after the Church Covenant series. We'll elaborate on public worship. But here's a preview. Our worship should be reverently centered on the triune God. It's not about us, it's about Him. And everything we do should communicate His worth. How we sing. What we sing. How we pray. How we listen. What we do. How we respond. Even our business meetings. Do you realize this? They are a part of gathered worship. Not identical to the service. God, but God has not stepped out of the building when we when we have a quorum. The business meeting is not, not where we become less corporeal and more corporation, uh, less body of Christ and more business of man. Now, we may have certain procedures for the orderly functioning of the, the church, sure, but they are not to be divorced from reverence, from the presence of Christ in our midst and the Spirit of Christ tabernacle, tabernacling in His people. When we are in Sunday service or when we are in QGM, we gather in His name. And we also do that at the communion table, which is not a, a bygone relic of a past age. It's part of our worship, and it has a, a, a both a vertical and a horizontal element. Vertical, as we remember and in some senses commune with the Lord, who is the head of the church, and horizontal, as we consider His body, the local congregation. Honor to God, service to His people, denying self. Is this your understanding of what goes on in our Sunday services as we seek to love God and love our neighbor? We are not a preaching center for those who enjoy preaching and then disappear. King Herod loved preaching as well, and he wasn't even converted. We are not a singing center for those that are tired of the party atmosphere of, of some churches and are looking for something more conservative. We are not a training, in, training kids in morals center for those who just want their kids to shape up before they ship out, at which point often the parents ship out as well. Now, if you are here with us, it's for the glory of the living and present Christ and for engagement with His beloved people, to love God and to love your brothers and sisters in Christ. He who does not love 
does not know God, for God is love. Fourthly, we resolve not to be a distraction to meeting together. We don't want to put a stumbling block to, in the way of worship of God. Now, of course, some people will find stumbling blocks anywhere. Years ago in another church, someone actually tried to leverage uh, the church into letting them have their own way because he said, if I don't get this, then it would be a stumbling block, so you must then do what I want you to do. I'm not talking about that manipulative spirit. I'm just talking about basic common sense. How, how, how we clothe ourselves. Is it modest or is it inappropriately revealing? Is it wise or is it designed to draw maximum attention to oneself? Or how about hygiene? <laughs> Not for the cleansing of the soul, but for the sparing of the nostrils. <laughs> Brushing your teeth. Or, or how about being contagious with some illness? So some say they won't let a little sickness keep them from worshiping with the people of God. Well, that's a commendable spirit, but what about the person sitting next to you or in front of you? who might not be able to take time off work or go to a doctor if they get sick or may have an important event they've been planning months for coming up and now they get sick. Or what about cell phones, scrolling through them, answering messages while in worship? All of these can prove very distracting to the special and unique day of meeting together. And there's a reason we don't have ushers moving up and down the aisles selling popcorn and hot dogs and pouring espressos into cardboard paper cups. It's because we're not here to watch a performance. We don't want to be distractive. We are here actively worshiping the living God without a picnic. I realize toddlers may need some soft, quiet snack, uh, nothing that crackles or smells like fish paste or cheddar, please. But aside from the unreasoning toddler who can't quite comprehend what's going on, I suggest that if we can safely get through a class or a movie or a meeting without serious risk of starvation, we could probably get through a Sunday service as well. And of course, as parents, this can be challenging at first to train our children, to teach our children to sit quietly and to take notes if they can write or color in if they can't while they're listening, or to take toilet breaks on time and when necessary. And there's a learning curve that kids go through. I realize that, but it's doable. And that brings me to the next point. We bear with one another while meeting together. Because we need to be long-suffering and slow to take offense, to act as Colossians 4 says to the church, a church like ours, to act with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. I don't mean we become purposely distracting and then stand on our rights and say, bear with me. That, that would be selfish. I mean that when others are forgetful, when others are clearly struggling, we're governed by Christian charity and love. When the baby starts to cry mid-service, and the poor, exhausted mother or father has to scoop them up and get that bag of baby goodies, and it's all falling out as they pick it up, and it's clattering, and it takes them a few moments. We, we don't turn around and give them the look. You know the look. We don't do that. And we're sympathetic to a difficult phase, and we, we keep focusing on worship, or we give them a hand if they're struggling. And when the parent who's training their small child to pay attention has to let them slip out the room for the second bathroom break in 20 minutes, we understand it's a process that children have small bladders. We give them time. Or when a child knocks over a pencil bag and it rattles loudly on the wooden pew, we smile and thank God that we have children in our services. Because we want mothers and fathers and children and babies here as we meet together. They belong with us. And besides, it's virtually guaranteed that sooner or later, we ourselves will be the cause of distraction, forgetting to turn off a phone or something, or we will give offense through our insensitivity. I've done that on many occasions. I've been absent-minded. I've chosen my words poorly. We all do that. This is a place of forgiven sinners, yes, but it's not a place of perfect forgiven sinners. So we, we still expect 
to fall short of the glory of God, and we bear with one another. As Hebrews 12, 14 says, we strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which none shall see the Lord. And then lastly, we give attention to other meetings together. I've focused on the Sunday services as the high point of gathered worship because that's when we're all together. And, and again, I, I commend to everyone our evening services as being a most excellent opportunity. Though I understand that some have entirely valid reasons for not being able to join, I do commend the service to you all the same uh, for you, if you are able as a time of more fellowship, more worship, more of the sanctifying effects of, the, of sitting under the preached word, more spiritual benefit to members and their whole families. So I commend them to you, uh, understanding the limitations of some. But aside from the Sunday services, which are of primary importance, there are other meetings that are worthy of our attention. Business meetings, as mentioned. Prayer meetings, meeting together to unify our voice before the living God and say, our Father in heaven, not merely my Father in heaven. Or small groups, HFGs, or Friday combined fellowship, or Sunday school before the service, various ministries, ladies' ministries, men's ministries, youth meetings, moms and tots, all of those sorts of meetings and all the private meetings together the individual social interactions for meals and prayer as families, and we'll talk more about that later in the series. Of course, no one can go to all these meetings, and there are other responsibilities in life as well. But to be a member of a church is more than just one meeting on a Sunday morning. There is a sense in which the church becomes a hub in one's social life, not to the exclusion of others, that are outside the church, but certainly with special attention to those that are in. And I'm not going to give anyone a number. Uh, it's not going to work if I do that. I'm just, suggest, I'm just reminding folk, commit yourself to the local body. So as we conclude, I will just say this. We gather in His name, putting Him first, representing Him in alignment with His will, desiring His glory, serving His people. We ecclesia, we assemble together, we church as one. It's what God's people were known for. And it would be a denial of the Bible to say otherwise. To be here today, to be a part of the church, is a privilege and it's a delight. It's a duty, yes, but it's a joyful duty. And I'll close with a very short testimony of grace that I find both challenging and encouraging, and one that I hope will stay with us all for a long, long, long time. Some of you remember Brian Johnson, who went to be with the Lord 10 years ago. A longtime servant of Jesus Christ and his bride, the church. Nearing the end of his life, though very unwell from cancer, and having just been discharged from hospital, he showed up one Sunday evening for a prayer meeting. Looking weak and unwell, someone asked him, understandably so, Brian, what are you doing here? You need to be at home in bed. To which Brian just said, I need to be with God's people. What a testimony. Of course, he absolutely could have rested at home. Not one person alive could say otherwise, and the elders lay no burden on anyone to attend when they are suffering as he did. It was grace that allowed Brian to join us that night, perhaps grace so that that testimony could be heard and repeated. The only reason I mention it, though, is to show his passion for the gathered church and the challenge he leaves to those that are healthy. Remember the words of a godly saint, I need to be with God's people. Will you pray with me, please? Our Father in heaven, 
Thank you for the design of the church. Not the architecture and the structures and the building, or even the mechanisms that allow it to function smoothly, but for the divine will and genius that created a body of people to be filled with the Spirit of Christ and to live and serve one another in a community of saints. We confess our shortcomings and our need. We thank you, Lord, for your strength and your enabling. We ask that you would keep growing us and reforming us to the honor and glory of your Son. Amen.